Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Irene Huang, and I'm a performer and researcher. My instrument is percussion. My research concerns with understanding how to learn in order to optimize performance. And this takes place routinely in my own personal practice, teaching, collaboration with people, rehearsal, performance, recording, and in laboratory settings. That being said, a lot of my work also has to do with embracing creativity. For me, that can mean free thinking and experimenting without judgment. In this case, a lot of the process is based on intuition and listening. Therefore, there seems to be a conflicting zone in my work. What I mean by this is that there is a fine balance between the critical self-reflect, the analytical thinking, and the free experimenting. However, for me, performance is clearly the top objective and the research is the inner working to bring one to deliver a top performance. Therefore, I have set up today's talk in the performance mode because that's what I do best. I have loosely adopted the rhythmic structure from John Cage's composition, First Construction from 1939. In this case, he used four plus three plus two plus three as the basic organization of the composition. In my talk, each unit is 45 seconds long. This is also inspired by John Cage's 45 minute for speaker. Over there, my assistant Jess has a timer. She will strike a gong according to the time structure predetermined prior to the talk. And as it proceeds, various events will take place accordingly. When she hits the small gong, I shall move on to my next event. In the beginning of Francis Yet's book, The Art of Memory, Yet's described the following. At the banquet given by a nobleman of Tiesali named Scopas, the poet Simonides Osseos chanted a lyric poem in honor of his host by including a passage in praise of Castor and Pollux. Scopas meanly told the poet that he would only pay him half the sum agreed upon for the panegyric and that he must obtain the balance from the twin gods to whom he had devoted half of the poem. A little later, a message was brought into Simonides that two young men were waiting outside who wished to see him. He rose from the banquet and went out, but could find no one. During his absence, the roof of the banqueting hall fell in, crushing Scopas and all the guests to death beneath the ruins. The corpse was so mangled that the relatives who came to take them away for burial were unable to identify them. But Simonides remembered the places at which they had been sitting at the table and was therefore able to indicate to the relatives which were their dead. The invisible callers, Castor and Pollux, had handsomely paid for their share of the panegyric by drawing Simonides away from the banquet just before the crash. This experience su suggested to the poet that the principles of the art of memory, of which he is said to have been the inventor, noting that it was through his memory of the places at which the guests had been sitting that he had been able to identify the bodies. He realized that orderly arrangement is essential to good memory. He concluded that persons desiring to train this faculty of memory must select places and form mental images of the things they wish to remember and store those images in the places so that the order of places will preserve the order of the things and the image of the things will denote the things themselves. And we shall employ the places and images respectively as a wax writing tablet and the letters written on it, unquote. 
This was a great story and a testament to a time when good memory was crucial to one's survival and the collective history. Ebbinghaus was the first to systematically investigate the human memory. He devised stimulus materials that were relatively simple, nonsensical, and homogeneous in order to study memory in the laboratory. The first problem that arises in standardizing the method of investigating memory is that due to the subject's mental state, for example, fatigue, attention, a fixed number of learning trials would not always be appropriate methodology. In order to make sure that material was learned to approximately the same degree from test to test, Ebbinghaus introduced the method of learning to criterion. In learning to criterion, the subject repeated the material as many times as was necessary to reach a priory level of accuracy. For example, one perfect reproduction. Secondly, to address the problem of how to measure the amount of retention, Ebbinghaus invented the savings method in which he subtracted the number of repetitions required to relearn material from a criterion from the number originally required to learn the material to the same criterion. This provided an index of retention that was independent of whether the material could be consciously recalled. With this procedure, Ebbinghaus made some important discoveries about human memory. First, he was the first to describe the shape of the learning curve. The time required to memorize an average nonsense syllable increases sharply as the number of syllables increases. Memorizing at <clears throat> Second, he found that distributing learning trials over time is more effective in memorizing than massing practice into a single session. And he noted that continuing to practice material after the learning criterion has been reached enhances retention. Thirdly, he discovered that early and late items in the list to be memorized are more likely to be recalled than middle items and that a small amount of initial practice can lead to savings and relearning. Finally, he addressed the question of memorization of meaningful material and estimated that learning such material only takes about one-tenth of the effort required to learn comparable nonsense material. The implications for the performing musician are many. 
the musician should spread the amount of rehearsals over time and not try to cram a long rehearsal into one day. Special attention should also be placed on material in the middle of the piece, since the early and late material will be more easily stored. Furthermore, by practicing more and making the material more meaningful to the musician, there will be more savings when the material has to be relearned. Question, how does this apply to contemporary percussion? And how does one make the material more meaningful so that there can be more saving in my relearning? We will come back to this question a little bit later in the talk. What is a percussionist? When asked this question, my mentor, Stephen Schick, likes to say that using the German word Schlagzeug, the percussionist is someone who hits stuff. The stuff we hit and how we do it might be different from culture to culture, but the basic motion of striking remains the same across the board. Beyond sharing the basic motion, of course, there are many subcategories of motions we use specifically on different instruments. We will get into that a little bit later. In general, we can say that there's the motion of up and down, up plus down, or maybe only down, maybe only up, or perhaps sideways, which form the choreography one learns as we learn to perform a piece of percussion music. Where have percussionists been? Percussionists have been around for a long time. In some African traditions, they are often the most important musicians. For example, a master drummer in the airway drumming tradition is not only a drummer, but also the conductor and the person who is in charge of the flow of performance to guide the entire ensemble of drummers and dancers. In Chinese Peking opera, the percussionists are the timekeeper, the accompanists to fight scenes, and the musicians who create dramatic musical moments through a set of pre-composed rhythmic motifs. In Bali, entire villages can be percussionists through the communal way of living and making music together at a daily basis with the gamelan. In Western music, the use of percussion has evolved in parallel through centuries of symphonic development. Military marching tradition and the influences of many world drumming traditions. For example, the use of the kettle drum was developed into timpani and Beethoven's incorporation of the Turkish symbols was only the beginning of the modern day approach the possibility of inclusion of objects and instruments of the widest consideration. What is a contemporary percussionist? In today's world, percussionists may come from a wide array of backgrounds in music training. My first instrument was the piano. Many percussionists' first instrument was the drum set, and some people started directly on the percussion. Once we make the decision of becoming a percussionist, we realize that we need to be proficient on a wide selection of instruments. In addition, we might also need to be able to think outside the box, problem solving, instrument building, tackle new challenges, and at the frontier of various types of performance practice. What are some of the big moments for percussion? For the contemporary percussionist, we have witnessed an explosion in the last 85 years since the birth of ionization. The incorporation of city noise from 1930s New York City and the adaptation of a wide array of percussion instruments from different parts of the world. This all seemed perfectly reasonable for French-American composer Edgar Varese to use simultaneously in his percussion ensemble piece, Ionization, for 12 players and one pianist. 
In this piece, Varese used sirens, maracas, bongos, snares of different types, symbols, and various types to turn the daily noises of New York City into organized sounds. <laughs> Steve Reich took a trip to Ghana to study African drumming in 1970. Shortly after he came back from Ghana, he wrote the piece Drumming. The piece borrowed the structure found in many African drumming using 12 subdivisions in one bar. 12 can be divided into groups of two, three, four, and six, and this provides different ways of filling the patterns in the piece. In this work, he also used the techniques of build up by adding one note at a time in order to arrive at a complete pattern. Resulting pattern by highlighting some notes and not others to bring out other melodic or rhythmic possibilities, as well as a way to enrich the listener's experience. Phasing by gradually shifting speed of one player against another in order to arrive at a different just position in the composite pattern. And last, build down by removing one note away from a pattern at a time to come to a resting point in between movements. Instead of hiding the compositional processes, Reich's drumming shows the process of going from one thing to the next, and that became the composition itself. The world of percussion was forever changed when John Cage decided to write for percussion instead of pitches and harmony. Through his three constructions and other percussion ensemble works composed in the early 1940s, Cage had opened up the possibilities of combined use of fun objects, non-Western instruments, noise, silence, as equal parts in his works. This included Cage's extensive and elaborate construction of the prepared piano. By detuning and deconstruct the timbre of the regular piano into a world of percussive and temporal possibilities. Here we see the preparation page of the prepared piano in Amores. Cage asks the pianist to insert rubber, screws, washers in between the piano strings in order to create a quasi gamelan sounding piano. Circumstances, free choices, etc. Which the words need to stick to 
pointer than pulse. And not in the way which we need to live. Form's not the same twice. For instance, Sonata? someone said, art should Fuse. come from within. That two or more then things happen is at the same time is their relation. But it seems to me the beginning of this work in progress goes with was not a part for a pianist. And I don't see but the curiously enough, six short forms, no one of them lasting more than a minute, or it, or four strings players, that is, a four strings player. When art comes from within, which is what it was, surely things happening at different times so are also related. related. If it is needed to be clear, magnetic tape makes it perfectly so, that we are not in a cult or any other, other discrete situation. The reason I am presently working with imperfections in the paper is this. I am thus and able to designate certain aspects of sound as though they were in a field, which of first, course, second, no good. they are. Until finally I explained to people that Persafasa is the original surround before surround system was available. Instead of putting speakers in different parts of the hall to form a surround experience for the audience, Zanakis put the player he wanted the sound to come out, and this is how Persafasa was conceived. Here you have the diagram of how the piece should be set up with the audience in the middle, and we're going to go ahead to demonstrate for you the second page you see on the right-hand side. Here we go. One, two. When Safa was composed, players were struck with the graphic notation of the score, in which no time signature was ever given, and some instrument choices are left to the performer's discretion for a large part of the instrumental selection. The performer has the role to decipher the written score in multiple levels in order to come to a version of the score for learning and performing. One, orchestration. The freedom to choose instruments ranging from material type to temper within material type, and of course, pitch selection is wide open, except for the basic relationship of high to low within each category. The freedom to group and bar the basic pulses into larger groupings, and in some cases, players rewrite some sections to give more structure in using various time signatures. Three. The physical organization of the setup is done according to one's own past experience, and there is no indication in the score on how to set up the piece. Depending on one's choice of instruments of various categories, some setups will be larger than others. Four, players have to come up with solutions to deal with some quasi-impossible tempi asked for in the score. And now we'll ask Peter to play the very last section of the piece. some of the unique challenges to the contemporary percussionist. The percussionist needs to cover a wide range of instruments, and the specific techniques to those instruments are not always the same. For example, timpani, 
requires tuning using different pedals, pedal mechanism can be quite different from one brand to another, requiring different motions of the foot to handle pitch change. The assumption of proportionality cannot always be applied to percussion. For example, a percussionist might learn to play the C major scale on the marimba, and this is similar to the one on the piano. This knowledge can be transferred to an array of keyboard percussion instruments. However, learning to play the C major scale on a steel drum resembles nothing like the ones on the, on the marimba. Changing notation. In the case of marimba vibraphone and many orchestral instruments, there is a standard of how things are notated. However, in the case of multiple percussion, both in solo and ensemble settings, there's a lack of standardization of notation. Here, there are two examples from early multiple solo works. Zeklus by Karlheinz Stockhausen and King of Denmark by Morten Feldman. Ever-changing setup. Concerning multiple percussion, the composer will ask for a list of instruments, and this list is usually different, and therefore how to set up the instrument will be different. There's no fixed positions corresponding to score notation. For example, when you go up to the piano, you will always know where the middle C is. This does not exist in multiple percussion. This is a picture of the Stradi Soda by Stravinsky. And the percussion part is partially inspired by jazz drumming, early jazz drumming. In this case, Stravinsky asks for bass drum, tom-toms, snare, cymbal, tambourine, and triangle. Decades later, American composer Stevenson came along and wrote a sequel to Soldier's Tale and basically used the same instruments. However, the way the composer used the instruments was so different that I was unable to play two pieces from the same setup. What happens when I try to learn a piece? Well, every time when I pick up a new piece, it's not just learning a new piece on a familiar instrument, but often learning a new instrument. This new instrument is perhaps made up of familiar instruments and objects that I have played in the past. But their unique combination can often be the first time and the only time I will play with each percussion score. Time spent building a functional setup using the corresponding instrument to the score and to construct flow in percussive choreography can take a large amount of time in the initial stage of the learning process unless the composer has a consistent notation and has several works for percussion and I have already played another piece by the same composer. The composer's notation is built on a standard word, works which are played often. Here is Zihua's piece, which we'll hear later today, and he had used Zanakis' basic setup and instrumentation and notational system. The player's ability to translate notation to physical setup based on previous knowledge. Therefore, the more advanced the player is, the faster it will be to put together a new piece, as the player might have a specific system on how to build a piece. In my case, I have always used right to left corresponds to high to low, and this is partially based on my early training as a pianist, and my first percussion instrument was the marimba. Therefore, I have always built my setup coming from a keyboard perspective. After the initial putting together forming a keyboard perspective, I will go ahead to adjust the position of the instruments depending on the frequency of an instrument used. For example, I might place the items that I play more frequently in front of me um, so it's easier to reach. I also adjust the setup in order, to, in order to achieve an overall flow of choreography. In this case, some composers who have worked with performers closely have come up with suggestions on exactly how to set up their, play, their pieces in order to achieve a good performing condition. 
This is the setup page from She Who Sleeps with a Small Blanket. Composer Kevin Volans worked with percussionist Robin Schikowski to come up with the setup you see in the score, which helps the player to play a blazing fast tempo required in this work. I also try to not only cope with, but adapt quickly to different sounding and physical setups by fine-tuning the inner relationship among different instruments used. Last, I also pay attention to my musical gestures, both instrumental and expressive, to fine-tune my choreography. Here, I'm going to ask Peter to demonstrate a phrase from the excerpt that he had just played for you. Uh, the first time will just be the motions of the phrase, and the second time will be the same phrase, but using three objects that he just picked up um, right before five o'clock. So he has never practiced on this setup before. Before the Romantic period, most musicians either improvise their own music or play from the score. Clara Schumann and Franz Liszt were among the first performers who made a point of playing from memory. From recent studies on memory of exceptional musicians, according to Ayo and Williamson, stated that there are three principles used by professional musicians to memorize music. Orally, for example, through listening to recordings, hearing one's own practice carefully, singing and reciting one's part. Two, visually, through the analysis of the score, visualizing the notation, visualizing performing on one's own instrument, extending to visualize the gesture and choreography on the instruments in the case of multi-percussion. Kinesthetically, through rote learning, repetition, and muscle memory. Couple of things which will be considered out of the norm for multi-percussion in the above mentioned methodology. Recordings might not be available because they do not exist. The physical arrangement of the instruments may not always be the same. And in most cases, musicians memorize music by naming the pitches they have to perform and practice singing their part, either aloud or internally, think Sofesh. This is one of the three principal strategies mentioned. For the contemporary percussionist, we need to deal with a great number of non-pitch instruments, and the tuning of these instruments are not fixed. The use of anamatopia is common. Those anamatopia symbolizing or mimicking the sound of the instruments. This kind of verbalization system is commonly used in traditional music, for example, in the practice of North Indian tabla. In the context of the tabla, the player spends a long period of time initially to understand the exact correspondence between the anamatopia balls and the strokes on the drum. And this relationship is normally a fixed relationship. Therefore, when the tabla teacher is teaching a new piece, he or she can demonstrate through reciting the composition and not necessarily through demonstrating each stroke on the drum. Karen will demonstrate for you this composition that is on the slide.
This type of precise correspondence does not exist yet in the practice of contemporary percussion as a standard methodology. The potential of developing using either the model of solfege by transplanting it into non-pitch instruments or some sort of onomatopoeia mimicking instrument sounds can possibly be beneficial to the long-term retention of information. In the case of visualization regarding score study, it is possible that one will find no obvious patterns in the work of contemporary music. One's own analysis of the work might not be based on theoretical framework of the 19th century romantic harmony and rules, but rather on a set of logic applicable only to the score at hand. In the case of percussion, the gestural aspect can serve as visual and physical representation of the notation. In Jennifer Mishra's A Theoretical Model for Musical Memorization, she addresses that memorization appeared to be comprised of three stages, preview, practice, and overlearning. In order to learn to perform from memory, overlearning stage is generally practiced by all professional musicians. The extent of how much time one spends on overlearning is based on individual preference. Mishra also divided the stage of overlearning into relearn, automatization, and maintenance rehearsal. In general, we agree that in order to perform consistently from memory over a long period of time, we have to spend time to relearn, in order to check in with the score, to know we have learned well and remember correctly, to practice automatization in order to play certain fast passages on automatic pilot. Three, go through maintenance rehearsal just to check in from time to time to know where we are with the piece such as what we did in preparation for today's performance. For the performance, uh, for the piece we'll play for you today, at the end of the event, the group initially learned the piece back in the winter month. They performed and recorded the piece, then put it away. In the last two weeks, they have come back to learn the piece um, in, for today's re presentation in two rehearsals. There are many motifs over, um, for overlearning in my case, I want to feel confident that I can handle whatever goes down. I want to make sure that I can get through my concert even if I'm completely exhausted. And those are all very important motivations for me. Today's title, Memory in Motion, Percussion Ensemble as a Lab, is borrowed from a research project funded by the Quebec Provincial Research Council, FRQSC. The members in this project, including my colleagues, Fabrice Mahondala from the percussion area, Richard King from the sound engineering area, and Sean Ferguson from the composition area. The basic idea behind the project is to investigate memory in percussion ensemble playing and to use this opportunity to create new pieces for the percussion ensemble. Most percussion ensembles do not play mem from memory. One goal we wish to investigate is how to apply scientific knowledge into the practice room settings how can we as practitioners use scientific research results available to us to further our own practice and learning? Furthermore, how can we use this opportunity to create something new and exciting artistically? Over the course of three years, we studied three existing works, Sensor 6 by Canadian composer Alcides Lanza, Aira by French composer François Bernard Marsh, Persephassa by Greek composer Yannis Zanakis. Then we asked three composers to write new pieces based on these three existing works. Each composer has to follow the instrumentation and notational system from one of the three chosen here. In year one, Alcides Lanza wrote Nes Minas based on his own earlier work, Sensor 6. In year two, Elliot Britton wrote 
parallelism based on Bernard Marsh's era. In year three, Zi Hua Ten wrote So Writers based on Zanakis' Persafasa. And here we'll play for you the composite video from all the different pieces, except for the one we will play for you live at the end of the event. Since it was a multi-year program, I will only focus on what took place earlier this year. Here is what we had in mind. By having similar notational system and instrumentation, the players hopefully can save some hours in the initial period of learning. By having the same instrumentation to a famous piece, it increases the chance of the commission work getting programmed by another ensemble. By having some criteria preset, we hope to observe difference in the learning curve. The study was divided into individual hours and group rehearsals. In the individual practice, we provided click track, as well as music minus one, essentially a karaoke track, for the players to use during individual practice. My assistant, Denny Martin, from the doctoral program in sound recording prepared all the click tracks for the study, and Denny has been the main research assistant I worked with in the past four years. He is also the head engineer on this recording program that you just watched, and this disc will be released on more record next year. The participants are able to freely use the click track and the music minus one in the laboratory during their individual practice. The same rehearsal schedule was duplicated. The first set of schedule was to study sections of Persafasa by Zanakis, and second one was to study Soritis by Ten. Three five-minute segments of each practice session is filmed. Today, I will show the summary of the exit questionnaire for the study. 
Um, in question number one, all six players had checked the mixed um, using some previous methodologies they have learned and using some new ones. Then there is um, a summary of the methods. That I try to ask them to articulate the methods that they used previously versus the ones that they started using when the study took place. Then based on those, we came up with the keyword and the summary here. <clears throat> In the next question, um, I asked about the effects of the various aids that we had designed for the individual practice section. Um, players found, four players found that the various um, aids, they were using all of them, and two players were using something else. And then I asked them if they had found learning Persa Fasa help them to learn Zihua's piece. Four people say yes, one say no, and one say maybe. The person who had answered no actually did not provide the reason. So this is not from the player who has answered no. What did you take away from the study? So here, three people um, were made to realize the scheduling practice section really helped them to learn faster. And three people had other um, things that they wanted to contribute towards the study. Has the study changed your way of practice? And I feel very happy when the answer came back saying yes for all of them. And in this one, um, there was long um, answers about the various things that they found to be helpful, things that they've changed. And here we have summarized some of the keywords just for the context of the talk. So you could see more clearly. We are living in an exciting time in which we have the opportunity to look at what we do through multiple lenses. Through this study, the participants in the program have found new ways to examine deeper into their own personal practice and were able to walk away with new perspectives on how to best use their time in the practice room. In addition, we have contributed three fabulous pieces to the repertoire. Today, you will hear Soritis by Zihua Tan, and if you're around tomorrow evening, Alcides Lanza's piece, Nays Nemes, from year one of the study, will be performed at the McGill Percussion Ensemble concert. And this concert is at 7.30. So now, please welcome me to the study group. <laughs>